So this is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Listen for the word of the Lord. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The words of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. I saw a bumper sticker once that said, God is not dead, he just doesn't want to get involved. <laughs> well, if the prophet Isaiah had any doubt that God was alive and well and wanted to get involved, um, and didn't want to get involved, then his doubts were relieved. In the year about 742 BCE, if it was indeed the year that King Uzziah died, then he was in the temple just doing his thing, worshiping, kind of like doing the same thing you're doing here today. And all of a sudden there's this overwhelming vision that he has of God in all God's glory and the angels attending. And before you know it, he's signing up. The voice of the Lord said, who shall I send? And he's saying, Lord, send me. So be careful when you're out there worshiping today. <laughs> Anything can happen. But he doesn't respond like this until something else very important happens. And that is, the glory of God is revealed to him and all of a sudden he has this overwhelming sense of who he is. That he's a creature. That he's a human. That he's limited. That he's sinful. The way he expresses it is, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He has this understanding of the self in context. That is, the individual just not alone, but rather in relationship. In relationship to God, he sees himself as small because God is so magnificent. And then in relationship with other people, he sees himself as a part of a larger body that doesn't always do the right thing. And this is what spirituality is about, is growing in your understanding of the self, of yourself in context, in relationship with God and with others. Perhaps nowhere else in scripture is the self in context so powerfully described as in Paul's letter to the Romans, particularly in the section that we have read today, which is part of a larger section where Paul is comparing life in the spirit with life in the flesh. Joan Campbell Brown uh, was the um, General Secretary of the National Council of Churches for a time, and one time she told this story. When my youngest son, a medical doctor named Jim, was an intern and doing his obstetrical training, he was assigned to a wise old Roman Catholic doctor who had many years of experience. As my son came to the day when he was to deliver his first baby, the mature physician was at his side. The mother, surrounded by her husband, her mother and random family members, began the journey toward birthing a child. As the pain deepened, Jim was in and out of the room many times. Finally, the wise doctor said, Jim, you're making her very nervous. Just sit down and listen to her. She will tell you when she's ready to deliver. Minutes went by and suddenly she called out for her husband. Jim jumped up immediately. The doctor sat him down again saying, she's far from ready. A bit later, she called out in audible pain for her mother. Again, Jim got to his feet, but again the teacher said, not yet. She'll tell you when she's ready. Sure enough, in a bit, 
Amidst the groaning and pushing, she cried out, Jesus, Mother of Mary! <laughs> and the wise man at Jim's side said, Now, son, she's ready. <laughs> when the pain becomes unbearable, they invariably cry out for God. Paul says that we have received a spirit of adoption from God that enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. And when we cry out to God with those words that connote intimacy and trust, it is God's spirit, Paul says, bearing witness with ours that we are the children of God. This is the reality of the self in context. Isaiah had the experience, Paul teaches of the experience, that we are God's children. And when we recognize that, we both confess our need as vulnerable children, as well as claim a relationship that has incredible benefits. So the image here that Paul is using should, should direct our minds back to the parable of the prodigal son. You know it well. The son goes to his father says, I don't like it here, I'm heading out. Give me my inheritance, for in my mind you're dead. Just give me my money. The father graciously does. The boy leaves, squanders all the money, he's hungry, he's starving. He devises a plan, and this is, so this is a kid with a lot of plans devises a plan. I will go back and in order for to maybe my father will receive me if I come back with a certain condition. I'll be my father's servant. Maybe then he'll receive me back into his household and at least I'll get some food. And so that's the plan and of course he heads back to his father. Father sees him coming and runs across the field to greet him with open arms. Son, you're back, you're back. The son says, wait a second. I'm coming back as your servant. And the father says, oh no you don't. I won't have it that way. You're coming back as my child. And the father throws a magnificent banquet and celebrates the return of his son who was once lost but is now found. Paul says, you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Not a slave or a hired hand, but a child of God, which one receives as a gift and can never be earned. In her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, uh, Annie Dillard, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, writes, When I was six or seven years old, I used to take a precious penny of my own and hide it so that someone else would find it. For some reason, I always hid the penny along the same stretch of sidewalk up the street. And then I would take a piece of chalk and starting at either end of the block, I would draw huge arrows leading up to the penny in both directions. And after I learned to write, I labeled the arrows, surprise ahead, or money this way. And I was greatly excited during all this arrow drawing at the thought of the first lucky passerby who would receive in this way, regardless of merit, a free gift from the universe. This adoption that Paul describes is a free gift from the universe. Today is Trinity Sunday when we think about that great mystery that no one can wrap their heads around, that we don't have a good metaphor for or a good image, but God, though one, is in relationship with God's self, and that we are drawn up into that relationship as God's children and invited to participate in that relationship that God is in. That is very mystical. That is a great mystery. We will strain our brains trying to understand it. The Romans had some problems understanding it. Paul says, you've fallen back into a spirit of fear. 
and legalism, you don't understand the self in context. You don't understand fully who you are. To live from the deep connection, this deep connection with God, from this Holy Spirit that bears witness with ours, is to live in the Spirit. When we live in the full awareness of our place in the cosmos as children of God, then we possess and we demonstrate what Paul in another place calls the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When you see these characteristics in someone's life, you can conclude that they are living in the Spirit. Our tendency, though, of course, like the Roman folks, is to live in the flesh. Flesh here does not mean the human body. We all live in the human body and understand its limitations. For Paul, the human body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. Rather, the flesh is a metaphor best explained perhaps by theologian Paul Tillich some 50 years ago. He says, flesh is the distortion of human nature, the abuse of its creativity, the abuse, first of all, of its infinity in the service of unlimited desire and unlimited will to power. This desire of which we know something about through recent psychology and will, and this will to power of which we have learned much from modern sociology is rooted in the individual existence in time and space, in body and flesh. This is what Paul calls the power of distorted flesh. In other words, this world that we live in, as uncertain as it is, we're all grasping for security, so we seek power. We have desires, we have wants that will help so that we can feel like we're whole persons. When we live life outside of this dependence on God, then we live it in the flesh. When we live outside the reality of ourselves as children of God, then we live in the flesh. We forget our context and ultimately we live a lie because that's just not the way it is. A few years ago, on a television news program called Primetime Live, Diane Sawyer was interviewing the actor Robert Downey Jr. And he has had, of course, a well-known history of drug abuse. So Diane Sawyer asks him, are you a good liar? And Downey says, oh yeah, you have to be. And Sawyer says, are you a great liar? And Downey, yeah, sure. And Sawyer then asks, what is the lie that everyone should watch out for that you'll be telling if you're using again? And Downey thought for a moment and then he said, well, I'll be telling everyone that I'm fine, that I'm just fine. 